All right, <clears throat> welcome back to History and Coffee. And today I will be talking about the Ames uh, 1849 Rifleman's Knife. And um, this is really born out of a, a fairly unique and interesting period of American history that kind of gets glanced over. Um, sort of the pre-Civil War period on the American frontier. I mean, you go from like War of 1812, Louisiana Purchase, Lewis and Clark, Alamo, and then Civil War, and all the crap that sort of happened in between those things kind of gets glanced over, and that's really sort of where this this knife uh, comes from. So, now I've tried to make this video like five times, and um, the cat keeps coming and sitting on the knife, so we'll see how it goes this time. Yeah. So, um, back in the, um, back in the 1840s, um, the United States was facing a unique problem and, um, essentially we had started expanding out into the Great Plains after the Louisiana Purchase, um, and it, all, it honestly started as sort of a way to stick it to the South. Um, the South's economy was all agricultural. And, um, of course, the North relied on them for all the produce and grain and cotton and things like that. And uh, it gave them a lot, of, um, a lot of power politically. And, of course, the disagreements politically between North and South and economic issues and issues of taxes, issues of slavery... Um, the uh, the government at the see a cat's gonna sit on the knife. Oh no, okay. <laughs> the the government decided to um, start incentivizing. Incentivize is that a word? Anyway, incent <laughs> whatever. Uh, getting getting people to go out into this newly acquired um, territory out west, past the Mississippi and uh, start farming it. And this would have uh, sort of slowly worked away at the, uh, the South's economic power. Um, the South was very much against this and would, was championing for Native American rights and all this thing, which is pretty hilarious and hypocritical if you think about it. But anyway, so as settlers started to move out that way, they ran into a problem. Um, this problem was the, the Plains Indians um, as it turned out, were the probably the greatest mounted fighting force in the history of the world, honestly. Um, Plains Indians like the Comanche, the Apache, the Sioux were fighting, riding and fighting from horseback from the time they were children and honestly could probably best any of these storied uh, European hussars or cavalry units. Um, definitely give them a run for their money. And the United States military, which was charged with protecting these um, these settlers moving out there, we didn't have a single mounted military force. We had no cavalry, no dragoons, um, nothing. Um, <laughs> after the War of 1812, we had disbanded all of our cavalry units because they were um, they were expensive. And back then, I know it's a shocker, but the United States was very much against military spending. Uh, they saw it as a waste. Um, you know, we were an isolationist country. We used the military basically as a small police force as within the, the country, sort of a, a shield, and that was it. We didn't get involved in European wars or, you know, political crap outside of the country, so we didn't need cavalry. Well, until we ran into the Plains Indians. Now, there was... Uh, some private sort of mounted fighting forces, the uh, the Texas Rangers actually, which were raised by the state of Texas and assumed this role of sort of protecting the, the people of Texas after it won its independence. Um, and they uh, actually trained to fight from horseback just like the Comanches. Um, the guy, uh, I think his name was John Coffee Hayes, I believe, was the... Uh, He'd, he'd fought the Comanches so much that they gave him a, a, a nickname, which was uh, 
man that it is a bad luck to get into a fight with because devils side with him. And uh, he, he picked up a lot of the Comanche's tricks <coughs> and uh, techniques from horseback and uh, trained his rangers how to do that. And they, they were a very formidable fighting force of the day. But again, U.S. military out in the breeze. And uh, this came to a head in the, um, in the mid-1840s. A, a large wagon party was heading out past the Mississippi. And they received threats um, from one of the Plains tribes, I can't remember which one, saying, you know, if you, if you step foot in our land, we're going to kill you. So they, of course, wired to the United States Army saying, hey, we need some sort of escort or protection. Uh, can you send somebody? And they said, yeah, go ahead, we'll, we'll, we'll meet up with you. And they marched on foot uh, out of a fort and uh, by the time they reached the wagon train, it had been annihilated. Um, in fact, the uh, the uh, Native American horsemen harassed this military column all the way back and basically chased them across the Mississippi. And that was it. It was like, you know, we're, we're, we have no defense against this. And I know I've said this before, but, you know, you're talking about the age of the muzzle-loading percussion rifle. You probably get three shots a minute versus the uh, average Comanche warrior who from horseback can fire 20 arrows a minute. So we were completely outclassed. So finally, Congress decides to act and they raise a couple of battalions of mounted rifles um, and essentially dragoons. Now the difference between dragoons and cavalry, cavalry is trained to fight from horseback. Dragoons ride into battle on horseback and then dismount and fight. So they're a little bit down a tier in the hierarchy of, uh, you know, military units. They're sort of a little bit of a cheaper, um, a cheaper option for a mounted fighting force. So when it comes time to outfit these guys, you know, they're thinking, well, you know, we're going to give them, we're going to give them pistols, we're going to give them rifles, and they need some kind of edged weapon. Um, we don't want to give them a bayonet because that's useless on horseback and we don't want to give them a sword because that's clunky and gets in the way when they're on dismounted fighting. So naturally the ordnance department, I imagine some guy probably slowly removing his sunglasses and saying big knife in a cool voice and that's what happened. They, And this is actually the first uh, knife that was ever procured by the United States military ordinance for uh, issue. They gave him a big old knife, it's essentially a short sword, like a Roman gladius. And uh, another interesting reason why these things came, ad came about is, again, now we've raised this mounted uh, fighting force. We still know that we're, you know, despite these couple of battalions with their best equipment and stuff like that, we're, we're still hopelessly outclassed by the Plains Indians. Um, and so the, uh, the idea was to make them as intimidating as possible. So you know, big, big frickin' knives, the best weapons, and these big shiny blue uniforms with shiny gold buttons and, you know, hats with feathers in them and all. Just make them as, as blatantly, you know, as possible. Just over-the-top, ridiculous, you know, 19th century um, military uh, peacocking, basically. And... Uh, Believe it or not, that actually did the trick. When this unit was raised, uh, they took a, they they got in formation and you know shined up all their buttons and all their weapons and things like that, and they rode into the various um, villages of these Plains Indians that were being hostile towards us at the time, and um, said, "Hey, this is you know basically a show of force. Hey, we've got horses now. We've got all this shiny new shit. Look at our uniforms. Let's talk peace." And it worked. Uh, the, there was very little issues with the Native Americans after that they sort of saw, saw the show of force as the, um, the Americans being serious and um, it really wasn't until after the Civil War that was, there was more uh, skirmishing with the, uh, with the Plains Indians. So these knives never really saw much combat but they really had a, a storied history because um, again this was our first uh, mounted fighting unit. Well post uh, war of 1812 and um it was also one of the first units to be dissolved because of desertion uh, <laughs> when gold was discovered um 
at Sutter's Mill in California, these guys were stationed uh, fairly close to there out west, and almost the entire unit of dragoons or mounted rifles deserted and went to go find gold. So much so that the unit was just basically decimated. There was no, nothing left of them. And so they took these knives with them and they just start popping up all over the, all over the West. Um, you see in pictures of guys with them stuck in their belt in the gold fields. You know, when the Civil War happened, you see guys carrying these in the Civil War. Um, even as late as the, um, the Wild West, you know, the 1880s, 1890s, there's guys running around with these on their hips. They just sort of toured the entire frontier Wild West period of American history. And that's, um, it just, it really makes them fascinating, um, fascinating items. And uh, there was only a thousand of these made originally. Now there's lots of copies out there and there was ones made after for a uh, civilian purchase, but the, um, the original thousand Ames 1849 Rifleman's Knife knives that were made for the U.S. Army Mounted Rifles. There's still some floating around today. They're incredibly rare. Uh, this is obviously a reproduction um, made by Cold Steel. Um, it's not the best uh, reproduction. It's not made the best, but uh, it'll work for uh, for display, which is why I purchased it. Um, but anyway, just fascinating knife, uh, really storied history. Um, and, I mean, it looks cool as hell. It's a big-ass knife. Who doesn't love that? So, uh, thanks for watching. Hope you learned something.